have to leave the asteroid at a certain time because there's a certain minute when the orbits are right for the spacecraft to get back to Earth. I do not know what that minute is, but it's sometime in September of 2023. So it'll be a seven-year mission, take a couple of years to get to the asteroid, spend a, 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 about a year at the asteroid, do this spectacular touch-and-go sampling. Any of you guys going to talk about the TAGSAM or maybe? We'll no? Mention. We'll mention it. Okay. But you know, uh, a sampling, which it, we don't land on the asteroid, but just sort of touch it, grab some stuff, and get away as fast as we can before something happens to the spacecraft. Um, but there will be lots of science going on leading up to getting there, lots of science at the asteroid. Um, and Bennu already is the best studied asteroid via telescopes ever because of this mission. And we will know a whole heck of a lot more about it. So let me introduce our panel, who is going to be telling you more about OSIRIS-REx and some of the Tucson things. Oh, I should mention that once it launches from Florida, the activity, the, 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 everything that's happening with the mission really moves to Tucson. The science team will be located in Tucson. All the commands for all the instruments will go through Tucson. There is a building, it's at 6th Avenue in Drachman, a, an inconspicuous building other than the great murals on the wall. Uh, outside wall, one about OSIRIS-REx, one about the Phoenix Mars lander that also worked out of there. So, you know, everything will be happening out of Tucson until the sample returns. Okay, our panel today, first we've got uh, Dr. Bashar Rizk, who uh, is, will tell you about the OSIRIS-REx cameras. I'm not going to try to give their titles with the mission. If they want to, they can, because I will always get it wrong. But Bashar got his... Uh, uh, his PhD at LPL actually has worked on cameras or imagers on a number of spacecraft missions. Uh, so he's been through this before. Um, and he'll tell you a little bit about, you know, why we send cameras other than, you know, it's pretty. Um, Carl Hergenrother, who uh, he's an LPL undergrad grad, got a, a degree in atmospheric sciences from here, but uh, he's a, um, a talented Astronomer, he's found, how many comets have you found, Carl? Four. Four comets. Um, and so there's, you know, Comet Hergenrother, this, that, and the other. Um, but Carl will tell us why Bennu, how we selected Bennu. And then uh, uh, Dr. Mike Nolan, who got his PhD at U of A. If you didn't notice, there's a, a, a strong U of A connection here. Um, and uh, uh, Mike and Bashar both got their PhDs in this department. Uh, Mike went off and spent a while at the Arecibo Radar, the big dish in Puerto Rico. He was, had a number of titles, observatory director. He was head of the planetary radar section, did all sorts of things like that. He'll tell you more about the science that we're going to be doing at Bennu. So the way this works is that each of these three will tell you a little bit about, you know, uh, a part of the mission. And then we're just going to open it up for questions. So we'll start with Bashar. Is this pretty good? Yeah, OK, I can hear myself. Um, hi, I'm Bashar Rizk. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Tim. I, oh, good. I have been at LPL for more than 30 years. And I'm extremely delighted to be here and to be on this mission, which is the culmination of a lot of years of work by many, many people. So let's just get started here. I'd like, to, one year ago today, uh, we we put or integrated our camera suite, the OSIRIS-REx camera suite, OCAMS, onto the spacecraft. Um, you can see one year ago in a day, uh, the polycam was being carried up in its uh, red removed before flight cover uh, onto the science deck of the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. In this mission patch, you can see uh, the three cameras, the, the very narrow angle polycam, uh, the wide angle uh, SAM cam and the uh, middle medium angle uh, map cam, each with their own specific purposes. I'm going to talk somewhat about that, but mostly I'm going to try to motivate why we are interested in taking images of the asteroid, um, other than to make it a safe mission and be able to guarantee as much as we can that we're going to get a sample back safely. Uh, we are going to the asteroid Bennu. Uh, shown here compared to the Empire State Building, which it's a, 
a little bit wider than the Empire State Building is tall. Of course, it's got much, much more volume. Uh, it's a small asteroid as these asteroids go. Um, it, was, it was found in 1999 by the uh, automated asteroids uh, search linear. Um, it's, as Tim said, has been the most widely studied asteroid that we have, especially for a near-Earth asteroid. The, the OCAM suite will make um, the, the job of gathering a sample from the surface of this asteroid a lot safer uh, and a lot more, a lot more of a low-risk operation. I've shown Bennu here, which is right over here on the lower right, uh, in comparison with two other objects that were recently visited by Earth probes. This is Chirumov Garamisenko, uh, the, the periodic comet 67, uh, which was visited by the Rosetta mission. And this is the, the near-Earth asteroid Itakawa, which was visited by the Japanese probe Hayabusa. Uh, this one actually got some sample returned from it uh, back to Earth uh, to the tune of a few milligrams. Uh, this, the, the probe is still there. It's, we're not anticipating getting a sample from a comet back on Earth uh, any time in the next 10 years. But it's certainly an active area for interest. Um, the seen here, uh, these objects are very small, but also that what you notice is they're very irregular. And the low gravity makes it difficult to sample or even operate near these objects. Uh, paradoxically, you're moving very, very slowly what would be the problem? I mean, as slow as you're moving around these objects to the tune of a few centimeters per second, why is it dangerous? You know, even if you run into something, that's like that. You know, you're kissing it. Well, it turns out that when you have such a low gravity, other non-gravitational forces come more into play. And as these things go, spacecraft engineers, especially NASA spacecraft engineers, like to know what their spacecraft is doing as far into the future as they can. So if they can't predict with any degree of certainty what they're doing two weeks into the future, well, that's a problem. And when you have all these non-gravitational forces around, solar radiation pressure, asymmetric thermal forces, then you're not going to be able to predict where the spacecraft is even a day into the future. So things are get a little tricky. And that's part of the reason we have this camera suite on board. Uh, we will be able to identify hazards um, we're not going to use them directly to navigate, but there are a set of cameras on board that will be used to navigate. Enough more about that later. Oh, and I forgot to say, the, the, the second reason we have the cameras on board is to try to do science. And the science we want to do is to try to examine the history of Bennu and see what the surface reveals to us uh, about where this object has been, what is its experience. Because in, in many ways, the history of Bennu, a primitive object like Bennu, is the history of the solar system itself. We're finding out more and more about these small objects, and we're finding out more and more that their gravitational influence, even on the large planets, guided the evolution of the solar system in the current way of thinking, you know, way to, to, for, to be the way it is today. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here, and I'll try not to take too much time while I do it, but I want to present to you a number of images of different phenomena, not necessarily asteroid related, not necessarily even space related, but of different iconic phenomena and to try to understand and motivate that what we're trying to gather or, or derive from these pictures is an idea of what is happening at these, at these locations. So let's start with this one. This is a very uh, this, this image combines a lot of different themes here. That's Devil's Tower, which appeared in the movie um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's the Milky Way behind it. Um, this beautiful Wyoming field. It's Wyoming, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and you're trying to understand everything in this picture. Well, it would require many, many lifetimes to fully understand everything that's going on here. All captured in one image. Here's the Earth. Notice, on first, on first glance here, you see all this white stuff, all these clouds. And so if you look closer, you see that the edge here is not sharp and defined, it's diffuse. So you, you did immediately deduce that there is an atmosphere on this planet. And you notice here that all of the clouds, or a bulk of them, are concentrated near what would be the equator. And that's not, a, that's not an illusion 
that's where the intertropical convergence zone is. That's where Earth's hot box is, is, is located. It's the thing that drives the entire circulation of the atmosphere. Here is, and I think I have to operate it from another iconic image. You see that? The, uh, the, asteroids, uh, the astronauts of Apollo 15 are dropping a hammer and a feather at the same time, and they're hitting the ground at the same time, demonstrating that this is a vacuum environment. So already, from what you see in the picture, or in a video in this case, you're, you're, you're understanding the environment in which the, the, the physics is happening, and what kind of physics you need to be talking about. Now, why do we care about math? I, this is the first time I, I won't show any equations. This is the first time I'm going to refer to math. Right, well, some people are disappointed. Um, it's because, <laughs> it's because um, our understanding of the universe, our understanding of any phenomenon, is based on a creating a story about it. And usually it's a simple story. And it's a simple story usually involving balls or sticks or waves or something mechanically describable and mathematically describable in a very simple way. Now that's important because we don't understand things in a visceral way. We understand things through the stories and the, 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 the phenomenology that in, exists in our minds. And that's kind of how human beings comprehend the world. Okay, So these images are very important because they engage us on, a, on that kind of level. So mathematically, if you understand what's going on, then if you're, you're floating around in this underwater environment, you will understand how much time you have on your, on your oxygen tank and how, how, how fast you rise when you're trying to go to the surface so as to not keep residual uh, nitrogen and oxygen in your system. The same underwater environment makes the physics sometimes very different. These are paramecia in an underwater environment. And they're often said as, be, as floating in, in a physical environment where Aristotelian physics uh, you know, operates rather than Newtonian physics. Now, what is Aristotelian physics? Well, Aristotle thought that to keep moving, you had to keep exerting force to keep moving through an environment. Well, that's actually the case in this kind of environment. That, in fact, the paramecia that are shown here, half the energy that they expend is just in moving getting their cilia going and going through the environment. Often, your, your observations are complicated by uh, secondary phenomena. Look here at the scattered light from the uh, dust that's arising from this, well, let's call it a compost heap. <laughs> and seen from a different angle, so this is seen in forward scattered light. In other words, the sun is coming out toward us. It's illuminating from behind. Seen from a different angle, the same compost heap looks quite different. This is something that you have to take into account when you have images of, you know, especially new places and new surfaces in planetary, um, planetary imaging. Sometimes the scattered light itself is of interest, like in this image of Enceladus. Here is a forward scattered image, and you're able to see light coming off of the surface, sorry, um, molecules coming off of the surface in the forward scattered light. People have deduced that this is water and that there is a subsurface ocean beneath this body. In, so I, I would play this game a lot of times with um, middle school audiences. So I'm going to relegate you guys to a middle school audience. Probably had some of you in middle school. Um, the, the, what we would try to do is I would po throw a picture up there and I would ask the question, what's going on in this picture here? So here. This is obviously an environment, well, obviously is, is probably the wrong word to use here. This just seems to be an environment where uh, objects just float <laughs> and, and without, without any um, visible means of, of, of support. Well, what we know is that these objects are, are flying through uh, a, an air environment and that fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics is what's operating here, both in the case of a natural flyer and a man-made flyer. What caused this landscape? Well, now we believe that water, you know, rushing past the surface, carved out this entire canyon to the point where, you know, you have these very, very steep cliff formations that require that if you want to get a good view, you have to build 
structures like this. What carved out this landscape? Well, what we believe is that these were, this, this landscape was carved out by glaciers, okay? But you, you can only start to think about this area by looking at images of this, and by engaging on images of this, you start to piece together the history of, of landscapes like this. What about this? How did this object's surface become so pitted? Well, people believe that millions and millions of years of impacts saturated the surface with holes so prof profuse in number that you, you essentially destroy a crater every time a new one is created. Uh, what about this light? What is the source of this? So charged particles coming from the sun are believed to spark uh, uh, illumination or excite uh, a particular line of oxygen in the Earth's uh, northern regions and southern. Notice that I try to keep a scale here. So this is an actual Earth here, ju ju juxtaposed next to this sunspot. Strong magnetic fields apparently are causing this. So here we have explosions at two different scales. Is the physics the same? Is it different? Can we use the physics from one to help us understand what's going on here? So going through all of these different natural phenomena, you, you discover the physics that's going on in each circumstance. You draw generalizations. You make your theories. You make your stories. And then you try to apply it. And one of the ways that you try to apply it is by building more sensitive equipment. So here we have the actual detector that it's at the base of our cameras uh, was constructed by um, a detector manufacturer in Canada called Teledyne Dalsa. Um, you can see the dimensions here. And then as we go finer and finer at higher and higher resolutions, we see more and more of the structure. We've actually learned to manipulate the electrons to the point where we can capture the photons, convert them to electrons, digitize the electrons, and collect them in our, our electronics. So here is, these are the three cameras that we've been talking about. And they're surrounded by mechanisms that guide the light to the focal plane, collect the light from the focal plane, digitize it, and send it back to our computers, recording it and recording the images that we gather with it. So that is kind of what the point of the camera system is. And that's what we hope to start to, to observe with our, our first images that we take of this asteroid. It'll be a completely new place. We don't know. We have an idea of the kind of physics that we're going to find there. We don't know, though. And we're hoping that it will surprise us in the way that many of these images have surprised scientists in the past. Thanks. Thank next you, week, oh, go ahead. Next, we've got Carl Hergenrother, who will be talking about why are we going to Bennu? Yeah, exactly. Why are we going to Bennu? As of this morning, we know of 721,000 asteroids. Oh, uh, I don't have any slides. But we, have, we know of 721,000 asteroids and comets. Now, you would think with that many objects, it would be easy to pick a target to go to. Now, when we first started working on this mission, which was actually back in 2004, um, the OSIRIS-REx we see now was actually the third time we had submitted a proposal to NASA to build this mission. The first two times, it was simply just called OSIRIS, and it was, in fact, a much smaller mission. And originally, we were going to go to an object that was 2001 AE2. And just to kind of highlight how hard it is to kind of pick a target, um, we picked this object because it had an easy-to-get-to orbit. And based on a single spectrum that was taken, it looked like it was carbonaceous, one of these carbon-rich objects that probably hasn't changed much over the history of the solar system. Well, you know, we submitted the proposal. We weren't accepted. One of the dings we got was, well, the AE2 is this T-type, which is a certain taxonomy classification for that particular asteroid. We don't really know what a T-type is. Like, okay, fine, whatever. Fast forward a couple years, we've already picked another target, but fast forward a couple years, the Spitzer Space Telescope observed this 2001 AE2, our carbonaceous target from the 2004 proposal. 
And one of the key characteristics of carbonaceous objects are they're dark. You usually have a reflectivity of 10% or less. Well, this guy had a reflectivity of 25%. So it wasn't carbonaceous at all. So that kind of does highlight some of the issues we have with picking the correct target. But kind of moving back now to about 2005, you know, we submitted our proposal. We weren't accepted. We were looking for a better target than this 2001 AE2. So at that time, there were about 300,000 known asteroids. Now, most of the asteroids are spread all over the solar system. Some get many times closer to the sun than Mercury. Some get many times further away than Pluto. The majority are in the asteroid belt, so they're orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. Well, for even a billion-dollar class mission like OSIRIS-REx, to get a spacecraft out there, to rendezvous, orbit, collect a sample, then come back to Earth, you're talking a mission that's going to take more than a decade. And since you have this constant army that you have to feed and care for for a decade or more, it's pretty expensive. It's hard to do that for actually even under a billion dollars. So you go for objects that are closer to Earth, the near-Earth objects, of which many, at least half of, half of them, have been discovered by projects here and based out of LPL. You got Space Watch, which kind of pioneered the use of using digital CCD cameras to discover objects, and they use telescopes on Kitt Peak. And then there's the Catalina Sky Survey, which is where I got my start back in 1992 was with Catalina. And they have telescopes on Mount Bigelow and Mount Lemmon in the Catalinas. And for a while, they were using a telescope down in Australia as well. So if you limit yourself to the near-Earth asteroids, now you drop from 700,000 to 12,000. Still a huge number. But again, not every object is created equal. Some of them, like I said, get too close to the sun. Some get too far from the sun. Some have orbits where their inclination, the, the angle at which they come out of the plane of the ecliptic where the Earth orbit is too great. And to get to those particular kind of objects poses two problems. One, you need a giant rocket. And for this New Frontiers class mission, we were given a choice. We could launch on an Atlas V, a Delta IV, or a Falcon 9. And not the heavy versions of these rockets, some of which haven't even flown yet. So there's some objects you just don't have the energy because you don't have the rocket power to get to. The other problem is even if you could get to them, your sample return capsule only works up to about 11 kilometers per second when it hits the Earth's atmosphere. Some of these objects, because of the high eccentricity, the high inclination, you're talking about what effectively you can call an impact velocity with the Earth's atmosphere of 40 kilometers a second. The return capsule wouldn't work. So you'd have to design one completely from scratch. So what you end up being drawn to are objects that have very, very Earth-like orbits. You know, semi-major axis of around 1 AU, which is the Earth-Sun distance. Eccentricities that are not too great, maybe about 0.2, so not spherical, but not these parabolic comet-type orbits. And inclinations that are only up to about 8 degrees. So you're looking for truly the most Earth-like orbits of the near-Earth objects. And when you make that discriminator, now your 700,000 drops to 12,000 drops to 200. Still looks like a lot of objects, you have 200. The problem is most of those 200 objects are really small which means they were only observable when they were passing by the Earth. And four days later, they were too faint. So for a lot of them, they're effectively lost. They'll be rediscovered at some point in the future by future asteroid surveys, but can't send a spacecraft to something if you don't know where it is. The other problems, these small objects, this is a thing I was doing research on when I first came onto OSIRIS, is that they have a habit of rotating extremely rapidly. The fastest rotator we know about rotates once every 16 seconds. How, I mean, just not only do you have the problem of how do you get a spacecraft to kind of station keep around something rotating that fast to pick a sample of, you're rotating that fast, centrifugal forces are actually greater than the gravity of the object. Anything loose should be thrown off the surface. So is there anything to even pick off these objects? In fact, could they just be giant boulders with no what we call regular pebbles that are on it? So once you get rid of all the small guys, now you're down to 27 objects. So you know, you're quickly starting to run out of stuff. Now, we didn't want to go to just any kind of asteroid. We wanted to go what was these carbonaceous asteroids. And you know, the conventional wisdom is the carbonaceous material formed in the outer solar system. It hasn't experienced a lot of heating. Um, some of it did get transported into the main belt. Some of it has since been transported into near-Earth asteroid space, which is how Bayne got here. But this is material that 
I'm not going to say it absolutely hasn't changed over the history of the solar system, but there's been a minimal amount of change. So we're hoping to collect samples from an object that is basically exactly or close to the same as what it was four and a half billion years ago. So if you limit yourself to carbonaceous, well, of those 27, the majority of them have no classification or taxonomic information for them. At the time, only I think about nine had any kind of spectral information that we could even say they were carbonaceous or not. You drop to five. Now we only have five to go to. And two quickly raised to the top as objects that had the most Earth-like orbits. We definitely knew they were carbonaceous. They weren't rotating too fast. They weren't rotating too slow. And they seemed to be the right size. And the two ended up being 1999 JU3 which, if that rings a bell, it's because that's where Hayabusa 2, the Japanese probe, is going to. And for a few months, that was our target. This is before Hayabusa 2 had even, Hayabusa 1 had even gotten off the ground, so Hayabusa 2 didn't exist. And then I knew this object, 1999 RQ36, was buzzing the Earth in September 2005. I went to the telescope, I made some observations, saw that it had a 4.3 hour rotation period, got some colors, saw it was a B type which is an asteroid that's slightly blue, which is kind of a rare type. Um, the nice thing about B-types is that, well, Phython is a B-type. And if that rings a bell, it's because that's the Geminid meteor shower parent body. So, oh, here's something that might have actually been cometary in the past. Uh, Els Pizarro, Wilson Harrington, these kind of asteroids that have shown cometary activity are also B-types. So that suggests B-types might actually, not only are they carbonaceous, they might actually have some water in them, some kind of volatile material in them. And so finding out that Bainu was a B-type, I said, you know, I had kind of had my, one of my eureka moments. I said, what do we know about Bainu? And looked online and, well, no one had published anything. Did a Google search and then found out that Mike had been observing Bainu back in 1999 and then again 2005. And so we had seven meter resolution radar shape model of it. So that was really good. So we actually know exactly what the shape is of it. And found that other people had confirmed, confirmed that it was a B-type. So, Quickly, that rose to the top, and that became our target. Um, since then, there's been one other object discovered, 2008 EV-5, which had we known about it at that time, probably would have been in the running, but it wasn't discovered until later. So it really came down from 700,000 to two, and then we ended up with one. So you can see how close we could have had no viable targets for this sort of mission. And I'll hand it off to Mike, who will talk a little bit more about our science. I should probably turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. I don't, oh, yeah. I don't have slides. <clears throat> so why, so, so, so what, what's the, um, the, the scientific reason for doing this? What, why, are we going, why are we sending a spaceship spending not quite a billion dollars um, to an asteroid and bringing a piece back? Well, spaceships are cool. That's definitely part of it. Um, but the other, the, 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 what we call the scientific driver. You heard Carl say it, you've probably heard other people say it. Four and a half billion years old. The solar system's four and a half billion years old. How do we know that? Well, if you were out in the atrium there, there were some people showing off some meteorites, rocks. And if you look at those rocks in, in great detail, you discover they didn't come from the Earth. They fell from the sky onto the ground, and some of them appear to be extremely old if you do, if you do, do chemical analysis. and uh, I, Some of them are extremely old and are made of the things that we think the solar system is made out of. So if somebody says, well, how do we know how old the solar system is? How do we know what the sun's made of? What do we mean by that? We mean somebody took those rocks, opened them up, and studied them and said, I think this came from the beginning of the solar system, and this is what it's made of, so that's what the solar system was made of. We studied these rocks that fall on the ground and, uh, to figure out everything we know about the origin of the solar system, pretty much. But if you also look at those rocks, a couple of them may say this came from the moon. But we know that because we've been to the moon and those rocks look the same. Or this one came from Mars. We know that because we've been to Mars with spaceships and compared the rocks uh, and, and compared the, 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 what they're made of. We know they're the same. But most of the meteorites are just things you find on the ground. You might see them fall, but you don't know where they came from in space. So the reason we're doing this is to say, we're going to bring what we uh, we have the asteroids in space where we think they came from. We have the rocks in the ground. It's really hard to connect them. So what we're going to do is go get a piece where we know where it came from because we went there and picked it up ourselves. 
brought it back and studied it and say, okay, this asteroid that we at least have, we have pictures of, we've measured it, its, uh, we, we, uh, we've take, um, we've measured its composition, we've studied as much as we can in space, and we're gonna bring a piece home, and that's the meteorite that we're gonna go study so we can connect the, the thing we're measuring from which we learn about, you know, what the solar system is made of, what the Earth was made of, with the place it came from. So that's, that's the, the basic scientific reason we're, we're gonna do this. Excuse me. And, and that's never been done before. Well, okay, as he said, Hayabusa tried to do it a few years ago. They, brought, uh, th they had a problem and they brought back tiny samples. When, we, when they first told us what, what, what uh, first they said they had nothing, then they said, no, we found these tiny, tiny little particles. And then I went to a conference about three or four years ago where they learned all kinds of things from these tiny, tiny little particles. We're gonna bring back a handful, right? That's how much we wanna bring. And so that means it's enough that you can actually pick up a piece and look at it and again, take it apart and study it with every, every possible thing you can imagine. A little piece is gonna get distributed all over the world to do these studies. So the scientific reason for this is for once we're gonna have a, um, a, a sample from the early solar system where we have the sample that we can study in extreme detail and we know where it came from. We, we studied the, the asteroid it came from as well as we can and it's quite possible that the kinds of meteorites that would come from this asteroid, that if you took a piece of it and dropped it on the Earth, it, that they all burn up before they get here. We're not really sure that every possible asteroid, they, if, it, if it falls to the atmosphere, a lot of them may just kind of fragment and burn up. So it may be one that we've never seen before. And so that's the justification for why it is we're gonna go this, do this particular experiment. And you might mention why we're going to a carbonaceous asteroid. <laughs> why we're going to a carbonaceous asteroid. And the asteroid. carbonaceous asteroid is the thing, right, that, that if, uh, that's the material that life is made from, right? L uh, and possibly life itself could have originated in some way with the, uh, the electric fields and solar and magnetic fields and, and solar uh, radiation. <laughs> anyway, but so that's the material for on which life is based. And so this is the stuff. Uh, this is the stuff from which life was based, and probably how that stuff got to Earth to begin with to make what we are today. So th th that's what we're trying to study is right, the, the material from which life started on Earth. Uh, and we found, we found, have found rocks like this on Earth, but, but we've never connected them to, to their origin before. So. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we've got a big crowd. We've only got one me with a microphone. So raise your hand and give me a minute to get there. Yes, uh, we've heard you know, all about the engineering and how we're going to get there and stuff. What are we going to do with the samples once we get them back? Where are they going to go? Okay, so when it comes back, we're going to take, uh, I think, three quarters of the samples and archive it for later uh, because we don't know what people will be able to do you know, in, in 20 years. And then, uh, th so we expect to get back, like I said, a handful of material. And... So we, uh, the, 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 there's a team of people already getting ready to study this, and basically they're going to apportion it out to give uh, a bunch of different labs d uh, little pieces of it, and they've done things like, say, which studies do we have to do first, right? Because at first you're going to look at it with a microscope, then you might cut pieces off, and then eventually you're going to go dissolve it up in acid. So you want to make sure that you've got that all organized in the right order. <laughs> Um, and so there's a, a team of people developing a plan of how to initially do that. And then after some amount of time, it's something like a year and a half, um, when the team has done their initial study, what they'll do is have a, a proposal system where scientists will say, I would like two milligrams of this sample from little piece XYZ over there to do the following study. And people will, will evaluate these proposals to, to figure out how best uh, to, to allocate it. So there's an in initial plan that we have already, or we're developing right now. We don't need it till 2023, so it's not, we have some time. Um, but it's basically already developed of how to distribute this to, to basically do the best possible analyses of those samples when we get them back. And where does it get stored? Oh, and, it get, and most of it's gonna be stored at the Johnson Space Center, uh, where, where, the lunar, uh, where the moon rocks are stored. There's a, there's a facility that stores the moon rocks on a very, in a very controlled atmosphere so that they don't get, uh, uh, contaminated, and in that same facility, we're gonna. There's a storage facility that will store the bulk of the samples, but before they're distributed out to the to the team. Yes, um, 
My question is, uh, from this surface sample, how much are you going to be able to tell about the interior of, of the asteroid? Especially, I'm worried about the, the, the water being baked out on the, on the yes, surface. Well, and well of course, we have to uh, do the su surface sample because, I mean, one could imagine a drilling thing, but that would, that would be another billion dollars. Um, so that's the reason for this detailed set of cameras and spectrometers to go and characterize as best we can how those individual samples got right where they are, as best you can, but, but right? So imagine you walk up to um, a lava flow or a landslide or something. If you can see what's going there and then somebody grabs a piece and you can see where you grabbed it from, you can't necessarily control what you got, but at least you can tell what you think has happened to it. And so that's, that's why we're doing these. In, in the, uh, on most space missions, the cameras are the scientific return. Here what they are is to characterize exactly where that sample came from and how it was processed. So at least we know what happened to it and how it's connected to the interior. Because you're right, we can't choose to go to the interior, again, without another billion dollars. Bashar, did you want to add something? Um, thanks. Um, there are people in our community, eminent people, that believe that there's still water down there a meter or so below the surface. We have somebody up in the back, and then you, you'll be the next one. Um, I was wondering, how would the nitrogen that you are using to uh, loosen the samples, how w would that affect uh, the samples in any way? Well, everything we do affects a sample in, in some way. And so we have a huge campaign to characterize what exactly we have sent. So we chose nitrogen because it doesn't have too much effect on the other things. And so if we, if we see nitrogen gas on the sample, we'll know it probably came from us, right? So we can't, if, if we see ni nitrogen gas, we won't know if it came from the meteorite or from the spacecraft. And we had to pick something. And so that's the one we picked as being, it's stable and it doesn't have too many effects uh, and that sort of thing. And in fact, we're doing a big campaign to characterize everything that's been used on the, set, on the spacecraft, every piece of grease, every piece of metal, so that if we see something in the sample, we can at least have some chance of saying, is that from the, uh, from the asteroid, or is there some chance that's a contaminant that we brought with us and accidentally dropped? And so we're being extremely careful about that to say, what did we bring and what was there to, uh, on, the, on the asteroid? Okay, and then the next one is a couple rows down, if we can get the microphone there. But first, um, uh, we've got somebody who knows more about the mission than a lot of the folks here. Uh, would one of you explain where the nitrogen comes in? How did the tag, Sam? Um, the, the nitrogen is stored in three bottles for three sample attempts. Who's asking the question? Well, d just, just in explain general. Why, where the nitrogen fits into the mission. Um, it did, okay, so the, the, the way that the tag SAM, the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism works is like a reverse vacuum cleaner. Instead of sucking air and creating a vacuum into which dirt and particles will enter, it pressurizes a volume that is established when you cup the tag SAM head upside down. We, we, we think of it as right side up. but it creates a, a, a little volume there that's enclosed. You inject the nitrogen, pressurize that area, and the, the pressure has to go out into a vacuum to escape. In the process of doing that, it passes through a screen that traps the particles that are entrained inside that flow. The gas escapes, the particles remain, and that's how the sample is collected. Is that clear? Okay. Could you give some more information about the lander that's actually bringing back the samples, its size? Does it have propulsion? Uh, no, it, no, it has no propulsion. It's about 100 kilos, I think, um, or 100 pounds. It's, it's of that order. Uh, it was used. It's a, very similar to one that was used on Stardust to uh, return the samples to Earth. So it, 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 the spacecraft gets headed toward a specific uh, point in the sky, very close to the Earth's surface. Uh, and then it releases the sample return capsule. The spacecraft itself diverts. The sample return capsule continues in a passive way, a ballistic way almost, uh, toward the uh, exact angle, the exact uh, point on the Earth that it's going to come in. It slows due to the, the action of the friction of the Earth's atmosphere. And then at a certain point, a drogue chute is deployed, and then a main chute. And it puts out some sort of a signal so yes. that we know where it so is. It, so it can be located rather easily. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to go a little further on how we get collect the sample. So, you know, we have the spacecraft, and then there's an arm that extends out. And at the bottom of the arm is our sample collection mechanism. And you'll probably see more of this in the talk at 1 o'clock, Ed Bayshore's talk. But if you look closely at our sample collecting mechanism, and those of us who can remember the old car air filters, the round ones, you drop right in. That's what this technology is based on. <laughs> it literally looks like an old round air filter that we touch on the surface. We you know, blow these inert nitrogen canisters, kicks up the dirt, gets caught by the air filter, and then we kind of pogo stick, bounce off the asteroid. And then the sample return capsule I mean, is attached to the spacecraft. The arm goes, puts it in the sample return capsule, the door closes. The whole spacecraft comes back to Earth's vicinity. Like Bashar said, we spin up the sample return capsule, we release it. It lands in the Utah desert, I think September 23rd, 2023. And then the spacecraft itself flies by the Earth, and hopefully it should be in good shape, and hopefully it'll live on to go to other objects. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Could you be a little more specific about what you hope that this sample is going to tell us? What are you really looking for? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to give a, a hopefully a, a less satisfactory and a more satisfactory answer. <laughs> okay, the first answer is in any mission, you have to predict what you're going to find. We predict we're going to find uh, pristine uh, L, uh, uh, Pristine material that is related to the origin of life, we're going to find, um, th that, that's really the main one. The, the other answer is, every time we have sp sent a spaceship somewhere, we have predicted what we will see and been wrong. <laughs> and to my mind, that's why we bother. Right? That's what exploration is. If you, if you, if you find out exactly what you, what, what you expect to find, to my mind, you wasted a billion dollars. And that's a lot of money to waste. Fortunately, I'm totally certain that we won't find what we expect. We'll find something completely new and completely different. And it won't be because we measured it wrong. It'll be because there's things out there that we don't know anything about. And we're going and studying this. We're, we're exploring. We're finding those things we don't know anything about. So there's the, the specific things we expect to learn. And almost certainly the unexpected that we just simply aren't, aren't, don't have enough information to, to, to know about yet. Yeah, it's, it's um, How will we get to Bennu? Our because big rocket. Earth is moving and Bennu, Bennu's moving. Okay, that's very good. So um, with, this, w w with these optical telescopes and with this radar, we've measured where Bennu is very accurately. We know it to a, within about a mile of where it is at any time in the next 100 years. And so it, it, uh, the, the, we know where to aim the rocket to, to get there. But it's, it's a long way that it has to go. And so again, these cameras that we're using, when we get close enough, we're just going to take pictures and say, oh, there it is. So we, we know that we can get the rocket close enough that we can take a picture to find where it is. And then once we find it, we're just going to drive over there with the rockets. Other questions? Wait for the microphone. And, and we have fancy names for that, but that's what we're doing. <laughs> If I read the display out in the hall correctly, isn't one of, uh, one of the reasons we might be going to ben Bennu is that Bennu is expected to have the highest uh, possibility of, of impacting Earth in the 22nd century? Yes, uh, Bennu is currently the, 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 the largest risk object that we know of. It has about a one in 3,000 chance of hitting the Earth right in 2180 something. I mean, and it's the kind of thing where it has a very low chance, but if it hits, it's going to hit. We can tell you the, the time to the minute when it will hit if it does hit. Okay, so the reason, so we're, we're going and we're going to measure its orbit even more precisely. Okay, and so in a few years from now, we'll be able to say, well, it's not one in 2,700. We've measured the orbit better. Now we either know that it's one in a billion, and we don't have to worry about it, or we'll know that there's a significant chance of, of impact, right? We'll be able to say one of those two things. 
if there is a significant chance of impact, we have well over 100 years to deal with it. And Bennu is small enough that, in fact, if you just went and put some rockets on it or smashed into something with existing technology, this is not, we don't have to develop anything major new. This is like we could do it in 20 years. We could push it far enough that it wouldn't hit anymore, right? Because we, because we have such a long time, we have 100 years, you don't have to move something very fast in order that in 100 years it's out of the way. So we have to move it, I mean, we have to change its orbit about this much in order to make it so that it won't hit the Earth, if it is. So it, it's something we already know how to do um, if we discover that it is going to hit. So yes, that is one of the reasons is to basically either confirm that it won't hit or figure out that it's some the problem we need to solve. Yes, it is. It actually wasn't originally because that research hadn't been done yet when we selected Bainu. It was because, because up until then, people only ran out the impact predictions 100 years. And then because Bainu was selected, someone ran it out further and said, oh, look, 175 years from now, it's the most dangerous object we know about. So one of the, but we always had the intention of being able to kind of ground truth the models that we use for predicting the motion of asteroids, which are the models you need to do to figure out whether there's an impact. So whether Bainu is a potential impactor or not, we're going to learn so much about the interior of asteroids and how these certain forces like Yarkovsky forces that push asteroids around their orbits work, that we can take that knowledge and actually use that to prevent impacts from other objects other than Bainu. The practicing? Repeat the question. Right. So the question was, are we doing any redirect science there? Redirect is basically, are we doing anything when we're at the asteroid that would actually change its orbit? Because remember, we have the asteroid redirect mission, which is a NASA mission, which would literally grab an asteroid and move it. So that's a pretty good idea of moving it. And then NASA has another mission that they're talking about with ESA, the European Space Agency, called AIDA, ADA where they're actually, they're going to a binary asteroid, so it's a, you know, you've got an asteroid with a moon going around it, and they're going to impact the moon and see how the impact changed the orbit of the moon. So it's a nice little enclosed experiment. Basically, to just figure out, you know, if we do impact with kinetic energy another body, how much can you change its orbit? So we do have other missions on the drawing board that will do that. We're not actively going to change the orbit of Bainu, but we're going to learn a lot about its orbit, like Mike said, and we're going to learn better techniques for basically calculating the orbits of other objects. Well, you partly answered the question with that statement. I was curious, when you pogo stick off the um, asteroid, are you going to hit it with enough force that you can actually detect anything? No. 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 It, 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 well, for, we're specifically hitting it as gently as possible because we want to. We don't want to smash the sample. We want to get as clean a sample as we can. So, so the, the the impact speed is is about like this, and we're we're trying to be as gentle as we can to preserve the sample. So no, we won't see any. Yeah, we result. touch the asteroid at centimeters per second. I believe you said that it was uh, three samples you're taking way up there. No, that we have three tries. We get tries. one. Oh, what, we, have, we only have one sampler, so okay. we could like use it three different times, but then it would get mixed up. So our, our our plan is we will get one sample, and we have essentially three tries to get it in case there's some, some problem. And what's the maximum amount that you're hoping to get or that you can bring back? So the minimum is sixty grams, so a small handful, and the maximum is a couple of pounds. It depends mostly on what the surface texture is. If it's fine dirt or if it's a rocks, that, that's what it depends on mostly. We are running low on time, but there's one up in the corner there and then one here. Oh, there was a young man. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Up there. So on Osiris Rex, I see that the solar panels are angled upwards, uh, while most other satellites have them uh, flat. It, uh, was there a specific reason for that? The, the solar panels on OREX are gimbaled, so they can move in two axes and be turned to a number of different angles. And in fact, throughout the mission, they'll be altered, their angles will be altered to based on what we're doing at the time, always with the idea of maximizing their surface area pointed toward the sun so you can get more power. It's worth noting that in the t 
touch and go maneuver itself, when we actually gather the sample, the uh, solar panels are tilted back and away from the actual point of contact. So the angle you see is only during the actual approach so that the, basically the rockets don't, they don't interact with the rockets and the dirt. It's keeping them way uh, out of the way of the experiment. Most of the time they'll be flat. I, I was just going to ask, can we, um, are we going to get a chance to visit the Drake building anytime, like during the Phoenix mission? I don't know that. Uh, I'm sure during the mission there will be open oh, houses. I can guarantee it. And be in fact, what, what, right now we're building an auditorium over there to do the various public events. So I, yes, there definitely will be. I don't know the schedule for that. They, they still haven't finished the auditorium yet, but it's almost done. And uh, now during the actual launch, most of the people there will be at the launch. So I suspect not at that time, but I, there will be regular public events over the course of the mission, uh, and m many of them will be over there. Okay. Yeah, for two years, the, now we're calling it the Spock at the Drake Building will be, you know, mission control for the spacecraft. There will be plenty of opportunities to come visit. Um, my question is, is there any possibility that when the sample, um, when they try to, to get the sample, that they're, the surface does not um, have anything to give? We spend, we spend a lot of time in the intervening months preparing for uh, gathering the sample, identifying areas on the surface that will be sampleable. So the entire asteroid would have to be a solid a block of rock for that to be the case, I think. I think most of the time you'll be able to identify areas that will be sampleable on the surface. So yeah, we will be specifically targeting areas that have sampleable m material. But there may very well be regions of that asteroid where it's just bedrock and there's just nothing to pick off of. Right, but when we proposed this mission, actually the biggest thing that we had to prove, the hardest sell, was that we had enough information to demonstrate that there were places with dirt that we could pick up. And we have a lot of reasons to believe that by looking at the thermal properties and by looking at the way it spins and looking at the shape. Um, and looking at the radar reflectivity properties, we did as much as we could to make sure that, I mean, given that we can't go there to check ahead of time, that there is going to be material that we can sample. That, that was the, the, the one thing that was the hardest for us to convince people was, was the case. Last question. I was wondering if anybody asked any questions about the optics that were designed for the vehicle. I know that it, it was specifically designed for this mission. Uh, yes, that's correct. Did you have a specific question about that? Mm, just to talk about it in general. Well, How we is have it different. The 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 cameras that we have are the one is a reflecting system, a telescope. The other two are refracting systems, which predominantly use lenses to focus the light. Uh, the refracting systems are are based on designs that we had uh, previously used on other missions. The reflecting design was based on designs that other people had used on other missions. Um, there were some ch use of novel materials, but I think the first, the, the, the major innovative thing about the cameras is the focusing mechanism on the, the, the largest one, the telescope, called the Polycam, uh, which was designed here at LPL by a longtime LPL um, mechanical engineer, Mike Williams, um, with input from all of the, the project people and built here. And we um, had to work out some issues with respect to that mechanism. Mechanisms in space are hard in general. But otherwise, um, the cameras are what are called heritage designs. In other words, they have been used before and used successfully before. Uh, otherwise, NASA probably won't let you fly them. Okay, I want to thank everyone for the questions. I know there are some more questions, but we are kind of out of time. Um, so let's thank our panel.